We're now moving over to what is the fourth final plenary session of this conference on the sub-theme Entrenching Transformation and Sustainability in a Digital Economy, the role model, director's role, and my moderator today is director of the LPS Public Sector Initiative Associate Professor of Strategy, Corporate Governance, and Risk Management. Please put your hands together. Help me welcome Dr. Franklin Ungu. Please let's welcome him upstage. Welcome, welcome. Oh, is he online? Dr. Franklin, okay. Coming upstage. Let's put our hands together for him. Applaud, welcome upstage. All of that resource. And plenary speaker. Mr. Kiari Abba Buka, Managing Director, Africa Operations in Lax Limited. Our discussants, Mr. Ade Adepekor, Vice President, Corporate Government Relations from OLAM. Mrs. Kate Issa, the CEO, Kachi Company Limited. And Mrs. Cecilia Akin Tomide, our Special Executive Advisor. Echo Bank Transnationally Incorporated and Chairperson Sanitation and Hygiene Fund. Please let's welcome them up stage. Please a round of applause. Mrs. Akin Tomide coming up stage. And there it is. The power of redirecting the digital identity of directors through transformation and sustainability. Over to you, Mr. Frank Ngur. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, our president. As I said, I'm sure all protocols have been observed. So let's just uh, be on that same protocol. So let me say that this session is on, um, on sustainability and transformation. And if you noticed, I'm not sure if you've seen that IOD, can actually be said to be transforming too fast in terms of their, the way they are approaching sustainability. Let me start by saying that of the 18 speakers for this conference, 11 women and seven men. So you can agree with me that exactly, IOD is doing very well. In addition to that, our president is a woman as well. So you can see, and of this last session, they had four women, and Professor Kenneth really enjoyed. You know, when you're in the midst of women, they will always look after you, and they looked after Kenneth. And just moving into our session, we have um, our uh, Kayari Booker and Mrs. Kate Issa. You already have their profiles, because what they do and who they are more or less public knowledge. So there's no need for me to tell you who they are because so you already know who they are. So it's like me now telling you who our president is and what she does. So just going in, into the session and because of time, let me go to uh, Mr. Buka Kayare to say that you are more or less somebody, when I told somebody that you are coming for this, he said the veteran is coming. You've been everywhere. You've been in both public and private. You were with NESG. You are more or less junketing almost all parts of the world. I think you came back yesterday or this morning. And uh, so you've served as both executive and non-executive director in various companies in Nigeria. What do you think is the role of directors in the digital transformation of firms? And what are the major key things directors must do for a quicker transformation without jettisoning environmental, social, and governance sustainability. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, good morning, Prof. Thanks. Uh, all protocols duly observed. Um, I will like to go directly into 
um, the Q and A because that's probably where we get the most out of um, these sorts of conversation. Number one, the role of directors in digital transformation is extremely important. Now, what I mean by that is that digitalization with, you know, somebody mentioned AI, machine learning, all of those things, blockchain, whatever, um, is just right there in our faces. And it's an evolutionary process that got accelerated in the last few years. Uh, and by virtue of that, as users ourselves, things that we used to do have changed. And certainly some of the examples are right there in front of us, in our houses, in our cars, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the one place where hardly um, a lot of progress has been made are in the boardrooms. Now, digital transformation for corporations, if you sit on the board of, let's say, a financial institution in Nigeria, you see how quickly the acceleration of technology has been in the value delivery uh, of those entities. And as board members, you have to embrace it. But not only that, but in some instances, even the regulators are insisting that the board drives those digital transformation, including the cyber, for example, in the case of banks, cyber security, cyber being aware, training has to be compulsory, certain appointments have to be made by the board. Now, if the boards have been the historical boards of the old, which is that you bring in your friends and family around the table and call it a board, then you will defeat the whole purpose. Risks were discussed earlier in the earlier panel. Now those risks will certainly emerge and you know, bite the organization. So director's role is Im critically important. Now, along with that comes in the sustainability aspect, of course, of course, ESG or whatever you call it art, there is the United Nations um, uh, requirements, whether it is in financial institutions or in larger corporations. Now that has to be embedded into it. But the other thing that I was thinking about when we had this um, title picked by IOD is that, you know, throughout human history, there has been a lot of transformations going on. The industrial revolution, right? Um, from coal and the dirty industries to the um, measurements of time for efficiency in University of Chicago, uh, Deming's quality and all of that. In those progression, there hardly was a moment in human history where people said, hang on, how is that affecting our environment? How is that affecting you know, us even as people? We just, you know, the largest, the loudest, the whatever wins, and people just pursued in the wanton destruction of the ecosystem. But what I can hopefully get, or what we can hopefully get from digitalization is that it may bring with it, of course, there are risks there as well, a lot of resources are used, but at the same time, I hope that it embeds, you know, sustainability into that evolutionary trajectory. And how that is done or driven is at the corporate governance level. And that's where board members must play that significant role. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Zabuka, let me, before I go to Madam Cecilia, let me just ask uh, Madam Kate, you've been a serious advocate of issues relating to sustainability and uh, transformation. But as, as you know, an effective strategy should help drive business growth 
and ESG performance. How can directors use technology to promote strategies to achieve other SGD goals, particularly education? Thank you. Um, I want to use the opportunity to appreciate the president of this great institute. And I have to say that this past two days have been amazing and insightful, and especially bringing in a lot of young people. I learned a lot yesterday. And this idea of millennials on the board is very important. And I think as many boards as possible should adopt it so that they don't go extinct like dinosaurs. Um, and thank you everybody for the opportunity and for coming to listen. How, how can the board take advantage or what should the board be doing to ensure that their policies, that the thrust of the activities of their organizations take into consideration sustainability and environmental, social and governance, all these uh, words, acronyms that are thrown up these days. Especially in the area that I have passion, education. I'm gonna have to be disrupted this morning. I'm going to, and I hear I've heard disruption thrown up a few times and I'll take us back to foundations. We talk about technology. I listened to his Royal Highness um, Igwe of the Onisha talk about um, 45% uptake in technology in Nigeria. And I was thinking, what is he talking about? And then he said, it is technology that's already finished happening. And then he drew, drilled down to the need for education. The sustainability, the boards, I, I want, I would be advocating for boards to consider the sustainability of your workforce. There's a, sub, um, a study out by, I think is um, IMF, that in the year 2060, 60% 60 of the workforce will be Africans. So ask, you, ask yourself, how are you preparing this 60% of the global workforce? I happen to interface with the public sector around the area where education and policies happen. And I can tell you that the curriculum for educating your children in Nigeria is based on analog. And you're talking about digital. We haven't started yet. So for sustainability, we need to go back to the roots, engage with the policy makers to up Date, upgrade our curriculum to 21st century digital. And I, I heard talks about CSR. It's not longer charity, it's your survival. You're doing it for you, for your business. And so when you're gonna think about that CSR, you have to think about it as it affects your company in 100 years. I hope we're building businesses that will outlast us and be around for 100 years. I, 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 and, and I'm so glad, uh, uh, Frank, you gave me education to drill down to. A lot of people talked about, touched on it. I think Didi did as well, you know, on the importance of education, but what kind of education do we have? What can board of directors do about it? You might think, okay, well, you're not in Federal Ministry of Education. You don't own a school. You do CSR. You throw out a few dry bones in some communities. And it. Your is being educated. Your business, the continuity. The environmental impact of lack of good, proper education is everywhere. The pace of development in Nigeria, we're consumers of technology. I'll give you an example. I'll tell you a story. I like to tell stories. When we started to engage, going back from the year 2020, 2000, 2000, 2000, 
Now I'm dating myself. From the year, for, for over 23 years, we have been engaging Federal Ministry of Education to update curriculum. We sponsored needs assessment on the spot analysis uh, study of different schools. We developed a catalog that tells them this is the minimum requirement for your science schools to be able to embrace digital um, education, science education for Wayek, for Nico, and all that. But today, the curriculum is still analog. It's been very frustrating. So we then started to go to individual schools, to the states. I have to tell you that Lagos government is amazing. I heard them read out the things they've done yesterday, and they didn't mention this one. So let me blow their trumpet a little bit this morning. When we began to engage them, they actually have a STEM, uh, an advisor to the governor on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. That is the tool, or the uh, um, whatever, the launch pad for leapfrogging forward if you're going to leave the obsolescence of analog and project into digital, not as a consumer, but as an um, innovator, a designer, producer of digital um, equipment and, you know, and, and, and products. So we engaged her and she said, oh, we are already taking care of STEM, digital science education, nothing to do. Um, U.S. government is helping us, I say, and I had spoken to the person in the U.S. government a few days before, and I knew exactly what they were doing for them. I said, what exactly are they doing for you? Oh, they're giving us robotics. They're supporting us in robotics. I said, oh, wow. Amazing. Those are beautiful tool, um, toys. Let your children play with them after school. Not a problem, extracurricular activity. But what we're talking about is core curriculum in modern language, 21st century science education, not robotics. The whole science has finished by other people's children, and they bring you the toys to play with. And we're talking about your children learning to design those robots and program them. They listened. Fast forward, they're doing a two-school pilot run of STEM pedagogy in science education in Lagos State. How about you give them? I thought so. And when that works out, they want to deploy it in all their schools. It will be the first state to embrace 21st century tools for teaching their children. What can private sector board of directors, what can you do when you're not state government or federal government, your CSR, you think about survival is an existential threat for you that, your, that the people who are going to feed into your companies are learning analog. It will be more difficult to bring them up. So it's what, wherever you choose to intervene, how about you think about wherever you have influence, preach the gospel. Tell the people, we, Nigeria as a nation needs to step forward into the 21st century in our educational curriculum. And wherever you can, when you do the CSR, let it not be tokenism or altruism or something, you know, just it makes you feel good. Let it be sustainable and let it be intentional and let it be for the going for the, the sustainability and endurance of your business. How about you? Take um, a stand in, you know, wherever you choose, a school or whatever, and start from finish, think it through, to get them upgraded onto the uh, 21st century. When you also, I mean, I I I'll give an example. Individually as well, talk to your alumni associations. Go back to the school where you went to. Give back to them directors, you're in a position to whether individually or in your corporation, but let us do something about education. And, and bring in, uh, that, that is my own thrust for sustainability. Before I hand over, I have to tell you that I have, I, I was asked to talk on 
um, digital transformation in Africa economy. And I'm asking them, digital transformation, Africa economy, uh, uh, who is going to manage this digital economy? These analog graduates. I've gone to a number of African countries. I've spoken to some African leaders. It's not just a Nigerian thing. And it's unfortunate that they listen, they're excited, but the people behind them can catch the vision and is not moving. So what I'm going to say, please, wherever you are individually, think about this as an existential threat for our nation and do something about it. Let us bring a curriculum up to digital so that we can talk about digital transformation here, not consuming finished technology. Thank you. Excellent. I'm sure directors here, you have your job cut out for you. They are telling you to adopt schools. They are telling you to go back to your alumni associations and make sure that we have STEM properly embedded in all our schools. And let me also emphasize that actually when you recruit uh, for different companies, you see this challenge. So many people who claim to have first degree, they are, they, are, they are unable to even more or less show you the required experience to do basic jobs or require skills to do basic jobs. But let me take it to uh, Madam Cecilia. As you know, we have about 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And Madam Kate has more or less talked about education, but there are other development goals. So my question is, how do you think that directors can seize this opportunity offered by technology to advance other sustainable development goals? Which ones will you suggest and what should they do? I hope you can hear us. Yes, I can hear. And I hope you can hear me. OK, we can hear you now. Thank you. Fantastic. So um, first, fantastic conference. And congratulations to the organizing team. And congratulations, Madam President. Um, so on what directors should do um, to achieve ESG um, leveraging technology, and giving ideas of some of the um, some some specific ESG goals. I mean, I I would say that so there are seventeen goals. It's important first for directors to familiarize themselves with the goals and see which of those goals align maybe with their corporate objectives or that they are in a position to. Um, uh, to, to achieve. And after that selection, the other thing that they need, I mean, after that, I would say learning and development and, and familiarizing themselves with the SDGs and the targets, they have to be selective, not to dissipate efforts. Then it is important to actually as we, uh, as we formulate our technology plans, it's important to actually see how we can link our technology budget and our technology plan with our ESG objectives. So you have to also have your ESG plan or your plan that makes it clear which of the SDGs you would like to target. So of course, it will come as no surprise that for someone like me, um, gender equality, SDG five is, you know, I've got a flag flying on that one. Um, that's a critical one. And it's very easy for um, directors to target something like that, look at their gender, um, look at the, the gender constitution of their organization on the board, uh, on leadership levels, um, are, are they gender balanced or not? Now, how does technology fit into this? For example, for gender. And one easy way is for us women, one of the greatest challenges that we have in managing our careers is really 
um, just the demand on physical presence and managing that conflict between your family responsibility and your corporate responsibility and the demand on time and physical presence. Well, technology brings you into a borderless world. Technology delivers speed. Technology helps to deliver scale. And technology gives you multiple options of presence and participating, hopefully effectively participating in this conference, but I am not physically present. So technology gives to us women multiple options of presence, which organizations really have to take, um, in, I mean, have, have to start adopting. Um, someone talked today about the need for change of mindset. That change of mindset is critical. You know, before you go to where the job is, you know, you, you relocate to go take an appointment. Well, now you actually take the job to where people are. So here at Echo Bank, um, where I work, with um, presence in 39 countries and a lot of women working um, at Echo Bank, what you find is you take the job to the women. So they're in different countries, but they're working as part of a virtual global team. And so we have to drive those types of options and you, we have to drive them from the board. The board has to ensure that the investments in technology are also investments that you can link directly to their ESG, um, ESG goals or to the SDG goals and targets that they have. Um, another example that I can give very quickly is when it comes to responsible consumption. Um, for that SDG goal of responsible consumption, you start to have um, what you would call motion sensitive lighting systems. So these are basics, but it's technology that offers that opportunity for responsible consumption with motion sensitive lighting systems with, um, I would say motion sensitive um, water consumption systems. So if your hand is not under the tap, the water won't run. We see all of these things, but they're tied, it's technology controlling it, and they are also tied to SDG goals. So these are examples of how we can link our technology adoption with also SDG goals. And I've just given those two examples, not to take too much of our time. Thank you very much. Let me return back to our guy, Mr. Buka Kayare. As I you say, Kayare. Kayare, okay. Um, feedback noted. Is, I'll, I'll have to make it very sustainable. <laughs> so, as a veteran, as, as I said earlier on, you know that in education, the private sector is doing well. It's also believed that the Nigerian economy is more or less due to the significant contributions of the private sector. It means that both social and economic problems that we are now calling on private sector to really see what they can do. So if you look at what is going on currently, globally and particularly in Nigeria, recently with regards to the flooding, my question is how can directors leverage technology to manage business risk, especially climate change, and other environmental hazards. Wow. Um, yes, uh, this, this is um, uh, quite um, tough question. Tough is the word. But, but what I, what I want to say is that um, looking at it from the point of view of businesses, what we need to look for is particularly for companies that are more close to what happens 
and how you react, whether you are in construction uh, or even for that matter, you know, large technology outfits that have direct bearing on what we produce or what we consume and its effect on uh, climate change. That's one. The second is all the risks that come with flooding and or the effects of the climate change as we see it on a day-to-day -day basis. Unfortunately, here is the other question that I have in my mind, which um, is very difficult to situate, which is that you know anything to do with climate change or sustainability is a long-term thing, right? Well, that's what we were told. Um, plant a tree, do this, do that. Say, conserve energy, uh, make things more efficient and efficacious. Uh, but at the same time, companies are driven quarter by quarter if it is a PLC. Uh, even for limited liability companies where unless the uh, owners have a long-term view, and have changed their philosophy towards long sustainable value addition rather than short term uh, quarter by quarter, you know, IRR, uh, ROI on every little investment made. Uh, so so the, the, the balance has to somehow be found. And I think the place where that, that conversation about the balance that need to happen is at the boardrooms. So the directors must be responsible for all the things that happen, the good, the bad, and the ugly in our environment, and bring it into the boardroom. How you do that and how that conversation takes place is going to be quite difficult, and it depends on the companies. Because there are some companies that are much more closer to things that are happening. But, but guess what? We are in this ship where if there is a leakage, it actually inundates all of us. And therefore, all board members need to be paying particular attention to the effects of um, the climate change. And how can a company, by virtue of what it does and what it produces and what it serves, how can it be in purposefully be having that conversation and ensuring that that is driven into how the company is run? Now, the question uh, is left up to everybody, even though you asked me the question, uh, just like the Jewish philosopher, I am uh, answering it by asking a question as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. So you're more or less asking us to also help to rethink the question and provide and provide more answers in addition to the one you've given. So uh, Ms. Kate, let's come back. You know, you are, you've emphasized the importance of education. And you've told us that about 60% of our global workforce, we come from Africa. But you're also saying that these 60% are more or less still using analog. The question then is, how will Africa be able to provide quality product and services? How can technology help to achieve this? Just in line with your advocacy for proper education, particularly um, STEM. So the, the issue is how can directors leverage technology to deliver high quality product and services that are globally competitive and environmentally friendly? Thank you. Um, the beautiful thing is that technology makes things cheaper, easier. Um, and, and you can easily leapfrog. When there is a will, I'm sure there'll be a way. Um, technology today, I mean, is easy to adapt, but we are talking about homegrown innovation that addresses um, our peculiar needs in the country? How can directors help 
how can they ensure that Africa remains relevant, competitive? Africa right now is a dumping ground for finished technology. So we do need to begin that journey of transitioning our education to 21st century curriculum, 21st century. Um, the beautiful thing is it's very affordable. I'll give you an example. In um, the year 20, 2008, my husband decided to do something for his alma mater, the um, Kogi Dekina uh, Federal Secondary School. And I, I advised him. And that's what I'm suggesting here as well. Don't give money. Most of the time when you give money, money works. Give them, bequeath them a science complex. So um, he got a science complex built five streams of science fully equipped and donated it to them. It was interesting that when it was being commissioned, the governor of the state told the university, the VC of the university to be bringing his students to the lab in a secondary school. But that was analog at the time because that was the technology then and it cost X amount of dollars. Let's keep it in dollars because there are too many Naira rates, it's difficult to keep track. So we're staying with dollars. In 2018 or 19, I believe, February, before then, a school, uh, an old boy of a school in Ijebu, Ijebu Muslim School, approached him to support their uh, Founders' Day celebration. Again, I whispered, Pilo power, don't give money, bequeath them science. That's my passion, as you can see. So he commissioned for a five-stream science complex to be built in Ijebu Muslim School and be fully equipped. It cost 33.33% of what it cost to do exactly the same thing 10 years before. So it's much cheaper to do digital science equipment, uh, to a, a digital curriculum, much cheaper. When I presented the statistics, I actually did the math on my phone in, in, in Kenya where I was speaking to a, an African um, union panel like this. And, and, and then they say, why is it not being done? I've spoken to, I've presented it to a few African presidents and they're excited about it, but they haven't done anything with it till now. Why is it not being done? Is the will to do it? Is someone actually catching the fire and running with it? And that's what we need to do. I'll take away from here, please, if you didn't take anything else, understand that the ability to successfully and uh, compete in the global economy, especially when 60% of the workforce is coming from you, the decision not to continue to be a dumping ground, to step up and actually embrace technology and use it to solve our own problems and the global problems is just in that willingness to do something about it. It's just as the inertia. If we can insist that we don't want analog curriculum anymore, the will to change that curriculum because when we do is cheaper. And by the way, once you adopt digital um, curriculum, the children from high school, secondary school, teach off anywhere, they can be gainfully employed. They can use their gadgets to do the, the phone and whatever, to do all kinds of things. I, I mean, I, we employ in my, in my office in Kachi, we employ uh, science, um, science graduates, engineers and all. And it's interesting to see them come into work and they have no clue what to do. And they've got a degree. Who is going to do your research? Who is going to do the development? Who is going to produce those products that will be um, what competitive is what uh, Professor Frank said. And, and let's not all think we can all run away from here. We need to fix this nation. We need to get to work. We need to take ownership of it. A lot of Nigerians criticize Nigeria is not a solution. No matter how much money you have stashed abroad, if, you, if Nigeria fails, you fail. Your money finishes very quickly 
are you, are you going to flip hamburger? It's an existential thing for every Nigerian to insist that Nigeria works for the greater majority, not just for you, but for the whole nation. So we do need to be serious. And, and, and the board of directors, the decision makers in the private sector, since the government thinks differently, they think in a different way. I've been told not to come. Um, um, criticize the public sector, so I don't, they think differently. The private sector can do a lot to help. Let us not feel, you know, on um, this, how, on, 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 what is it now? Let us not feel um, powerless. Let us take our future in our hands. Let us run with it. Let us build this nation. Someone here said, these countries you go to, they were built by someone. How about this generation, the Gen Z and all from um, uh, uh, baby boomers and all the way, how about we build, intentionally build Nigeria and make Nigeria a reference point for the world? Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. Somebody just told me that the reason why African leaders ignore this STEM advocacy you're making is because they received analog education. So, so it's difficult when you receive analog and somebody is preaching digital to you. So what we have to do is to see how we can elect digital leaders who understand STEM education and all that, particularly women. Because you can see that the last session, we had four women and the president was saying that they want people like Dr. Adu to join IOD and all that. So let me take it back to Madam Cecilia with regards to issue of women. And you are a very serious advocate. As someone that is very enthusiastic, what options do you think that technology offers for women regarding career progression, more gender inclusion, and fair representation in the corporate world. Thank you very much. I mean, clearly it gives us options as women. Um, what, what I'm beginning to see and also on teams that I am a member of is that it, in the past you were limited by maybe the country you're in and so your exposure to transactions or your exposure to teams you can join are those within your country. But now we actually have people in Nigeria who are working um, for organizations in the UK or in Canada or in the US and they're located in Nigeria. And so, for, and also if you're working in a multinational, don't limit yourself to just the local um, local roles. You can actually stay in your country while being part of a global team. You just have to be able to manage issues of time difference. And so those challenges we used to have, yes, they still exist, but there are options they are not as pronounced as they used to be. And so you can you have options of greater exposure as a woman um, to, to, to actually be more, I would say, more attractive or to have the experience that would allow you to actually go into leadership roles. So you're not limited by your physical location any longer, but you have to embrace the technology that will make you agile, the, embrace the technology that would make you a key uh, member of a global team and also be able to deliver even when you're not physically present. Also, if you bring it to the home front, you have now the ability to work from home. We have to be able to negotiate those terms and negotiate them unapologetically. You you know, if you need to work from home because you're taking care of your family, be open about it, negotiate for it, 
and make sure you deliver while working from home. We're not going to compromise on excellence. We're not going to compromise on delivery because we're working from home. We will still deliver, but you can now work from home and still take care of your family. Now on the flip side, organizations have to be open to these transformations, to these evolutions in the workplace. And you know, everybody talks about it, now you have all four generations in the workplace. It's not just a gender issue, but all four generations in the workplace, the Gen Zs and the millennials think different. They, you know, the Gen Zs are digital natives. When you have a digital native in the workplace, they, <laughs> they think through issues differently and their demands of the workplace are very different. So if you want to retain talent, you also have to have the right policies in place that allows you to accommodate the gender dimensions of talent as well as the um, generational dimensions of talent. And definitely technology gives you the options to actually supervise with, or have oversight without physical presence. So we have to just break that mindset of physical presence being a requirement. Now, this brings things down to, I would say very basic, but you know, another example from a security perspective is you, you can see everything that's happening in your home, even if you're not in the same country. So through technology, so the, we, we have so many options that the challenges that sort of limited our career progressions, we can actually overcome those challenges by investing in technology. Now the investments should be both ways. They're investments that I have made personally. And then in the organizations, also the employers should make investments that would make their organization more gender friendly and more life cycle friendly. And, and so these are just um, some of the examples that um, I, I would like to give. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um... It's time to make it more sustainable. So it's now open to the audience to ask one or two or three questions to the panel members. Please, it's open now. And so there is a, who, who is with the, the mic, please? Is anybody that wants, can you come to the front? We have, um, okay, two actually. So you can also be specific in terms of who you want of the panel members that, you, that should answer your question. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Ladiji Michael from the Rustin Group. Okay, so uh, what's an interesting uh, topic? Uh, well uh, discussed by our eloquent uh, speakers, uh, discussants. So um, there's no doubt that the importance of ESG to not just our organizations, but also to the planet. As uh, we can't talk about uh, ESG without also talking about the circular economy. However, my question is, are there universal standards for evaluating this ESG performance? If they are, now, how do we measure these uh, performances across um, uh, different industries and geographies? Thank you. So the question is, how do we measure ESG performance? Is that correct? Across industries. Across and industries. Strategy. Who do you want to answer? Any of them. Any uh, of them, uh, okay. Yeah. So let's take the second question Thank and you. we... Yeah, good afternoon, distinguished uh, panelists. Thank you. My question yeah. I would like to be addressed by any or all of the members of the panel. 
My name is Philip Ashinze. I work for the Nigerian Agricultural Insurance Corporation, Abuja. Now, I'm taking us right from the beginning of these uh, conversations. And good enough, we're talking about the role of the directors. Somebody had talked about um, reports to board members. I remember the MD of S S FCMB talks about doing things better and doing better things. Two things. We've had situations where you have CFOs speaking directly to the board, making presentations to you to achieve sustainable digital transformation. I want to suggest CTOs should equally speak directly to the board members, make presentations to the board members. If you want to do things better and do better things, the CTOs, chief technology officers, don't keep them at the background. Boards of directors should bring them up to equally speak to the board members, just as the CFO does. The other one is, which I haven't seen around here really, if chief people's officer, the chief people's officer should also speak directly to the board. You talk about talents acquisition, talents retention. We simply assume in this part of the world that the talents are there. You can advertise that you have 1 million applicants, but we have all seen that these 1 million applicants probably do not have the skills to do that job. Whose responsibility is it to ensure that these talents are there and when you get them in, you retain them? We've heard about the issue of JAPA, of technology staffs or banks. Why should there be problems at all? If the chief people's officer had a seat and spoke directly to the board, I believe these things would have been addressed. And I believe that these are responsibilities that board of directors can very easily deal with because they owe responsibility to stakeholders of the organizations directly before they cannot go out and talk about indirect responsibilities to the society. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. But just to clarify, CTO means Chief Transformation Officer, is that correct? No, 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 Chief, technology, technology. Chief technology, technology Officer. I'm okay. a Chief Technology Officer. Okay, I wanted to know if there is a new, if there's a new uh, job in the, in the organization that is called Chief Transformation Officer. But I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a job that should be created actually, so that we can become more sustainable. Okay, any other question or should we just take these two? Okay, let's answer. Should we take all of them and we answer? Should we take these two and? Okay, let's take from Chief here. Who has the mic? Okay. Oh, protocol, Julius. My question is to my very good friend there. Uh, Piari. Uh, there was a question, Prof, you posed to him on how to use digital to address the issue of climate. And he answered that question by bringing it back to you. Yes, not no, to, to you. <laughs> <laughs> to you. Um, I am just of the opinion that. In all of the conversation around, around fourth revolution, we're looking at the issue of AI. Shouldn't we look at how AI can be looked at to focus or predict or forecast flooding and climate change and begin to develop a solution around that? That's a question for my friend. To so, Madam, incidentally, she's also my neighbor. Oh, not to her. Uh, you spoke eloquently about beautiful ideas regarding the educational sector. And um, you also uh, caution yourself that, oh, you are not supposed to criticize the government. Now, it is not really about criticizing. But faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
I am of the opinion again that these good things you are doing that appear to be PNC in the private sector at the federal government level, incidentally, I share a board in the federal government too. So at the federal level, shouldn't you carry this propagation? Never mind, don't give up until you win. So that this great idea can be pushed through and they begin to ed educate them that, look, it's not all about procurement. It is about bringing integrity into the system so that this country can be moved forward and stop Jagba. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last question for this round at the back. Thank you very much and a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, my question is, if you like a philosophical and or practical question, and it is this, I'm focusing on Nigeria. The unemployment rate, as we all know, is very, very high. And we've talked about the seismic effect of disruptive technology. And we don't need to look too far. We look at the unicorns of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, Apple, Steve Jobs, Microsoft, Bill Gates, and others. In other words, there's less work globally, and it's going to increase as a function of digital transformation and evolution. So the question is, how, or rather, what are your thoughts as to how that world of change, the world of VUCA, can be accessed by the teeming, the teeming unemployment we face in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have four questions, which our panel members will attempt to answer. But if you noticed, the four questions came from four men. So it wasn't very sustainable. So <laughs> if anyone you don't want to answer, please ignore and shift it to the audience back again. <laughs> My God, please. Yes. Um, the, the question about measurements, um, I'm not quite an expert, but here is one thing that I can actually put on the table, which is that if you make something, um, if you incentivize, uh, and I don't know how we are going to do this, I'm talking we, meaning the whole world, um, whether it's carbon credit or whatever, if you incentivize the arts that would make the world a sustainable place and put some kinds of incentives that would drive the businesses in towards that direction, then what we will do is that sooner or later, even though altruism is nice uh, and all the other nice things, uh, there will be a tendency for people to race in that direction. And so if the if globally all of us are facing the same direction and running in the same direction, then we will surely be able to um, make things progress meaningful and measurable. Um, I, I, I don't have really the answer. So um, the second one was about CTOs facing boards and uh, chief people officer and all of that. I think they do. The boards normally, uh, uh, well, I sit on boards of small companies and large companies. In the large companies, most of the boards have committees and those committees are responsible for certain aspects. But the key to what I th suppose you might be putting, and I may be putting words in your mouth, is that when it comes to digital transformation, um, the board should actively be driving it. I'm, I'm trying to remove any person in management out of that because the board has the power to delegate to management what needs to happen. And by virtue of that, then it comes back to them to be in the driver's seat to direct. I always, in my program where I facilitate at the IOD, 
I talk about the four pillars that the boards must be a, must hold very close to the vision, foresight, the structure, strategy, the delegation of authority, and holding management accountable. Those four pillars still play when you come down to it, when you crystallize it to the what directors do, they stand on those four pillars. The foresight and the structure come from the looking forward, looking into the future. But what do most boards do? Unfortunately, most boards spend time on last quarter's numbers. A good deal of time. And that is very, very unfortunate. Whereas you're talking about what you wanna bring into the future, which is the digitalization, sustainability, and what have you. Um, the tough question is still a tough question, sir, Jim. Um, but, but I do believe that we look at what we can do in terms of, um, uh, oh gosh, let, let me pick the philosophical one. Uh, it's easier, see? Somebody, um, uh, in the 19th or 18th century said something about if we can make machines intelligent. So if computers can be intelligent, which is what AI and all of those things are, um, they would end up being more intelligent than us. Then in which case, what's our role in how we conduct ourselves as human beings? Um, I'm I'm a I'm a student of technology. I'm scientists and all of that. Built simulation codes in my prior lives, you know, a few lives back. Um, but I always have this argument about what the human beings have, which is the cognitive aspect that we have that machines can never have. Well, I shouldn't say never, but can not do it as well the empathy, the feelings, uh, love, um, you know, many other things that you cannot actually code into a machine, call her Alexa or whatever. Um, she can't just do it. Uh, but we can, as human beings, still look at the collective value that AI and machine learning can bring about. Um, it's quite interesting. Uh, a friend of mine had a multiple heart attacks while he was wearing this watch, the Apple watch, uh, you know. And I discovered that in Nigeria, there is a component of the Apple watch that has to be disconnected because there was a connection with that there should be liabilities that shouldn't be. But there is actually an EKG app that you can download and it can monitor your heart. And if there are problems, it will actually alert you and you may actually do something sooner, later than, you know. And, and if you can do that early enough, you can, your life can maybe saved. And that's just a device. That's a few hundred dollars, right? So, so, so the game is how can we have, even at the top level, public sector, even at the government level, to have digitally savvy? You can remove that liability, you can put that liability clause and say by using this app, you are waiving your liability or whatever. And that way, you don't hold anybody responsible, but meanwhile, you are monitoring your heart. Um, it's as simple as that. And it can save, um, you know, lives. And by extension, lots and lots of, you know, gray matters that people that are contributing to the economic development of the nation may continue to do so even in their old age, right? So, so, so the question about you know, things that are happening and where do we plug in as society is that, yeah, today we are so far behind, but guess what? If we collectively have the right kinds of leadership, we may actually start leapfrogging. 
I have seen a society that had leapfrogged, even in our generation, you know, maybe in two generations, 30, 40, 50 years. You go to those, to those Southeast Asian countries. I remember as an engineer in HP, we went to a factory where we were training them on how to wear an ESD strap so that they do not uh, destroy the chip that they are putting into the components of laptops that we were building. It took us six months to train them. Two years later, they were selling their own branded products in the US and uh, using their you know, logo. You know. So yeah, we train them, but we train them to come and compete with us. And that's probably fine. So unless the world becomes such a community, interconnected, interlinked, in all aspects, um, the sustainability component may bring in additional uh, differences. And of course, digitalization would also expand those gaps. But somehow, there has to be a need for closing those gaps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayoga. And um, let me say that it seems, you know, at the last panel, one of the panel members said that she was watching television and the television asked her, are you still watching? And now Awaga has told us that the Apple Watch can tell you when you're sick or when you're not sick and you can go and check. So I'm just wondering if IOD just assembled people that will be telling us as if they pain us, if they sweet them. <laughs> <laughs> because you can see that it's a few hundred dollars. Meanwhile, minimum wage in Nigeria is $37 based on the current exchange rate. But let me just recap the question so that Madam Kate or Madam Cecilia can, if they want to attempt any of them. So the first question asked us, how can we measure ESG performance? And the second one said that is very important for chief technical officer and chief people's officer to be talking to the board directly with regards to some of these issues. And our chief here, who is your neighbor, said, is it not possible to create artificial intelligence that will help us to monitor flooding and issues of climate issues? And also encouraging you not to relent, to continue your advocacy to the public space, so that one day, one day, you know, election is next four years after this one, we might now say that it must be you that will be in Abuja and, and all that so we can fully implement it. And the third, the fourth one asks with the way technology is going, you can say we have so many AI coming up. Will it not more or less affect the issue of job creation, employment, particularly in Africa? So anyone, any of these questions you want to look into so that we can conclude. Now, AI, this is Cecilia. Please go ahead, thank you. Okay, so I'll start with the um, last question and probably work my way up. I don't think technology is, um, how should I put it? It's not the cause of unemployment and it's not that um, the number of jobs are reducing. Actually what is happening is jobs are being reallocated. Certain jobs that are repetitive in nature and it's you want to calculate you want to calculate faster give it to a machine um, give it to ai so certain things are being reallocated while other jobs that require human um, cognitive knowledge those jobs are still reserved for humans and that is why our educational policies are critical I mean, we, to a certain extent, I think a lot of our policies were anchored on our population growth. It is not now just the numbers, how many people you have, it's actually the quality of the people you have that determines what they can do. So if what you needed um, a thousand people to do, one robot can do it, your your, your demographic dividend is not a dividend until those people you have 
have something that the robots do not have, or they are the ones creating those robots, or they are the ones um, working on the algorithms that the robots will use. So it's not that the, 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 the number of jobs are reducing, it's a reallocation of the types of jobs, what humans will do, what robots or machines will do. And so it comes down to, I, I would say, what um, Kate Issa um, talked about, the importance of education. So it's the quality of the people you have and what they can do. On whether there are global standards um, or universal standards for measuring ESG, there are quite a few of them. Um, we have the International Sustainability Standards Board and um, the, the representative for Africa was on the prior, um, was on the prior panel. Um, there's, um, there's the TCFD, there's the, there, there are quite a few standards. And then the UN has the UN Compact with quite a few of the principles that um, businesses are adopting. And those principles are actually um, committing businesses to operate in, um, I would say, environmentally and socially responsible way. Then there was a question regarding, um, can, can we begin to predict or at least monitor when flooding and other environmental disasters can happen? And yes, some companies are doing that and some are developing software in that regard. So there's a company in particular that I follow their work. It's called Frame. F-R-A-Y-M, you can Google them and see the work they're doing um, in, in, in this regard. Um, and, and one, I'll, I'll just like to leave us with, with one thing. It's important first to watch um, our mindset and really change our mindset. Two, let's familiarize ourselves of the options out there that technology is giving us. Um, third is let us understand what the SDGs are. Let's understand what ESG means for a company and let's be selective regarding the SDGs that we want to identify as the ones we will target as companies, as NGOs. Let's be selective. We can't do all 17 of them, but we can be selective. And it, it, it's critical as directors that we take this seriously. It's critical that we get our companies to adopt ESG principles that are incorporated in our corporate strategies. That is what directors do. Let us make sure also that in our evaluation of performance, we actually have indicators that are ESG indicators and also making sure that our technology plan is linked to our ESG plan so that we're using technology to achieve our ESG goals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Madam well, I, I yes. guess I'm going to jump in. We have a few more minutes left. Um, I, I believe uh, Olga, Kiari, and Cecilia covered all the questions. I'd like to just add my voice to a few, to the um, disruptive technology that is taking away jobs, that we have a teeming population of unemployed people. The truth of the matter is most of our population is unemployable um, because they are undereducated. <laughs> Um, I am a, an employer of labor and it's frustrating. The more people you employ, the more brain you have in your head. They come to collect the salary, you have to do the work. Um, but that goes back to the education and it's affecting all of us. I'm sure a lot of directors here yeah, and the management are suffering the same kind of things that a lot of 
people in that position do. It's, it, so it's, it's existential for us to look at the way we educate, to get involved in that whole conversation and make sure it's done right. The world is not gonna wait. AI will continue and accelerate. Digital transformation will continue to transform. More gadgets will come to take away the work that we even are doing now. So we either get up, get on with it, or we're left, we're abandoned behind with all the wahala of having so many unemployed people, the risks, the insecurity. I, let, uh, let me just keep saying this thing. If we all run away from Nigeria because we can afford to run away, wherever you go to a refugee, in a short while your money runs out, what are you going to do? Cleaning house or flipping hamburger. So it's existential for everyone to fix this place. Reorientation is important. The fact that they've gone through school, that school didn't go through them, we can still catch them and begin to retool, retrain, reskill, you know, to get um, that team in population engaged for businesses have to get involved. Coming to my neighbor. I'm coming for lunch <laughs> after this. Um, you talked about not giving up, and I never do. I believe that quitters never win, winners never quit. I'm going to the president's office after very soon. I told her already, and I'm going to enlist her and all the people she brought here yesterday to be voices, crusaders, and you know, pushing for this change. The truth of the matter is we can't do tokenism on this thing. It has to be a national um, move. It has to be, there has to be a will from the top of the policy making of Nigeria to intentionally, and Africa as a whole, not just Nigeria, to intentionally decide to pull Niger Africa out of the boondocks into the present and forward to the future. Um, from the year 2000, I told you, I started to we at catch started to engage the federal ministry of education i personally went after every minister of education um until the right uh, the current one and there's a will to make the change but the federal system and the way things are done it can be a bit you know somehow um i got to the we got to the place where we actually made a very spirited push to you know, the Ministry of Education. It was like yeah, 2000, and there was a will to do it at the time. But then they needed to get in the curriculum board, the um, various um, interest you know, uh, stakeholders. The Director of Science and Technology Education said to me, oh, before the board will be constituted, it's gonna take too long, write a proposal. We wrote a proposal. The, then we got a letter from the legal department. Oh, we don't have money in the budget this year for lab equipment. So you wait, look for when we have advert out and put in, you know, your bid. No, it wasn't about business for us. It was about the life of the nation. And by the way, we had gone outside of Nigeria to mobilize resources to pay for the updating of the curriculum. It wasn't about us, it was about the country, but they lost it, they missed it. So we haven't stopped. This is a good forum for everybody to also begin to think about it. That, what that young man is talking about is what we're talking about. We have a team in the population that's unemployable, underemployed, undereducated. And more are coming through that pipeline. We need to get involved. The private sector cannot live it, but we need to also speak. And wherever we have influence, you're on the board of the federal government. Please, sir, <laughs> you're the chairman of the crusade now. We need to do something about this. And right now, we can't all dump Nigeria. If Nigeria fails, Africa fails. A quarter of every black person is a Nigerian. It's, you know, it's everybody's business to get this country right. And while I have this mic, 
please make sure you have your PVC. Please go and vote. And make sure everybody in your house votes. Let me tell you a story. The time is up, but I must tell the story. So I heard someone say to me, oh, she got all her house members to get PVC. I said, ah, that's a good idea. June, I told my residence manager, I said, payroll this month, you need a photocopy of PVC. So one person brought PVC, they got paid. Everybody else, ah, the remaining people minus one got PVC copies, they got paid. The last person brought, they got paid. I went to my office, I said in my management meeting, I said, I cannot keep your salary. If I do, you report me in the labor court. So you will get your salary whether you have PVC or not. But please, if there is any document you want to bring to my table, anything you want me to look at, Include your copy of your PVC plus all the PVCs of everybody in your department. If they're not complete, I'm not opening the file. Everybody has their PVC. It's not enough. Please get involved. Your life depends on it. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Let me just Chief. say. Yeah. Before I call on uh, my yoga to respond quickly to this, I'm sure you agree with me why I say that, you know, everything about Nigeria is about changing the laws of doing certain things. And I'm sure you all agree with me that Kate Issa is for Senate 2027. Thank you very much. <laughs> so please, my yoga, quickly. Uh, it's actually the aging effect, I kind of lost the question you asked. But but the, the good thing is that it's predictive. Storms are predictable. Um, uh, the weather forecasting yeah. business had been around for a long time, and especially the weatherman on TV. But, but it's more scientific than that. The climate change effects are predictable. But there is a team in... Seattle, I think they are in a warehouse in downtown Seattle. One of them used to be the CEO of Microsoft, invested hundreds of millions of dollars into innovative technologies to alter the course of weather changes. Whether they are going to succeed or not, it's another matter. One of the solutions they came up to was storms and hurricanes, how do you reduce them or eliminate them? And what happens for hurricanes in the US is that they start out of the Atlantic as storms. And it's that warm temperature that starts swirling the water and then it starts rising. And then before you know it, it comes in with a full force towards the Caribbean side and then now, what they're doing is to see if there is any way for them to change the temperature of the water that's swirling. And if you can nip it in the bud, right at the root, then there won't be hurricanes. Now, if you can do this all over the world, then there won't be storms and hurricanes and what have you. Um, now, that's changing the entire system. Uh, whether it's ethical or not is another matter, but but it's some bunch of guys working on this, spending lots of money, trying to do this in some clever fashion. So there is disruption going on everywhere, not only in the digital space, but even in the, you know, rains and clouds and so on and so forth. So thank you. Thank you. Thank sorry, you. Sorry, can I jump in one minute? I'm so sorry. We're talking about the flooding that happened in Nigeria. And we're, I'm getting a sense of maybe it wasn't predicted. Maybe is whether, you know, uh, what do they want? Global warming or whatever. No, this one was predicted. This one was avoidable. This one was known that it will come. It's not the first time it came. This one was just one of those things they say we shouldn't talk about. Thank you. Kate, you for seen it. <laughs> so thank you very much, our panel members. You answered all the questions very well, except the one on how do we measure ESG. My brother, of course, you know I'm a moderator and I'm not allowed to answer questions, but I will tell you 
that there's a way to measure ESG performance, and we teach it in Lagos Business School. So if you want to find out more, you come to Lagos Business School. So, 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 so on that note, we say a very, very big thank you to Madam Katie, Sir Mayorga, Buka Kayare, and Cecilia Kiare, and Madam Cecilia uh, joining us virtually. So thank you very much, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Please, a round of applause. Let's appreciate Dr. Franklin and Go. Thank you. And like he said, Lagos Business School is waiting for who? For you. Roll up. <laughs>